My name is Dr. Howard Robinson. I'm your MC for today. I am a member of the National Center for the Study of Civil Rights and African American Culture Steering Committee. I teach history in the History and Political Science Department, and I am the archivist at Alabama State University. Um, Al the National Center for the Study of Civil Rights and African American Culture is pleased to present the E.D. Nixon Institute on Research and Cultural Enrichment. The theme for today is African Americans and the transformative power of the ballot. Just, uh, one thing I want to do before we start our program is I want to acknowledge our elected officials um, in the audience today and some of our civil rights um, veterans. And so our trustee and circuit clerk, um, Timothy McCord, and I think there's a county commissioner here. <laughs> what is your name? Donnie Mims. Don, Donnie Mims, okay. Um, and of course, um, I will pass state senator uh, <laughs> and, and president, president um, Quentin Ross, Dr. Ross. I would also like to acknowledge um, Gene Gratz, Herman Harris, um, our some of our local veterans of the Civil Rights Movement, and of course, the longtime operator or conductor of the E.D. Nixon Institute, uh, Mr. Charles Warner. You stand, Mr. And, um, and who was at one time the, the, the youngest civil rights activist, Ms. Cheyenne Kreisberg, is she in the audience? Mm -hmm. Oh, right there. <laughs> I'd like to introduce to the podium Dr. Calvin McTeer, professor of mathematics at ASU, pastor at Bethel Baptist Church, the home church to the namesake of this program, Evie Nixon. Pastor McTeer will perform or, or give us our invitation. Shall we pray? Our Father in heaven, we come in the name of Jesus. We come to say thank you for this gathering. Thank you for these who have gathered together. I am a member and to exhort those who are in this political arena and how important it is for us to participate in our civil responsibilities. We pray now that you would bless us with your presence, bless this speaker, and we pray that you would bless this message. Christ's name, Amen. Again, I'd like to welcome you from the National Center for the Study of Civil Rights and African American Culture. On this occasion, the 2018 E.D. Nixon Institute on Research and Cultural Enrichment. E.D. Nixon was a very important and powerful local civil rights figure. From the 1930s through the 1980s, Edie Nixon was a civil rights leader here in Montgomery. He was a labor leader. He was, a, he was at the forefront of the Montgomery bus boycott, the progenitor to the Montgomery Improvement Association. This Pullman Porter and Pullman Porters were typically African-American men, railroad employees who serviced um, sleeping car porters or sleeping car um, passengers on the nation's railroads. This, this gave him several advantages. He was able to travel widely, met a number of influential people, became friends with Eleanor Roosevelt and other dignitaries who would, able, who would, who would, who would be able to um, facilitate and assist in his civil rights endeavors later in life. Um, e. Nixon led um, an assault against the literacy test in Alabama. He led in 1944 a march of some 750 black, mostly veterans, downtown to demand the right to vote. So he was truly um, uh, a visionary in Montgomery. Today, the E.D. Nixon Institute assesses um, the African American voting power, how that power has transformed the American landscape. And so to discuss today's um, topic, we have uh, a very important, I think, charismatic jurist, um, 
we are going to invite to the podium the, the 15th president of Alabama State University, Dr. Quentin Ross. He's going to provide us with an introduction to our speaker, Dr. Ross. Well, good morning. Good morning. And welcome to the Alabama State University. Uh, Dr. Robinson and to Dr. Franklin and to the Voting Rights uh, uh, for the Voting Rights Lecture Series and to the National Center and to the Edie Nixon Institute. Thank you uh, for being here. Now I, I'm uh, tasked with introducing our guest speaker, uh, but I stand here not adequate enough uh, to introduce an individual I think who is no stranger to any of us. Uh, for those of us who have uh, watched the way that the world has been shaped. We know that the man that sits before us has rendered decisions that has impacted a lifetime uh, in this country. And so again, I don't feel adequate enough in the words that are printed on the page, on the paper, in terms of his resume. Uh, don't speak to this silent giant uh, amongst men. Uh, and, and truly, I have to just speak from the heart because having the opportunity to watch him up close and personal, not necessarily by choice, but by circumstance, uh, to see the thoughtfulness and the meticulous way that he works within the frame of a courtroom, understanding every aspect of the law, ensuring that there is justice and fairness that's set forth through the trial. Uh, I can speak from experience. But more importantly, when you think about being the second, only second, African American appointed to the federal bench from Alabama, under then President Jimmy Carter, that the, you have history sitting here with you. Again, decisions that have impacted this country and will impact us for a lifetime. And so, from Tuskegee, Alabama, and, and as we talked earlier this morning, he had no goal to be a judge. But as we talked about it, God always has a different plan. Yes, he does. And we are just so happy and thankful that he had in his plan mm -hmm. to set a man on the bench who stands for justice and equality for all in the Honorable Judge Myron H. Thompson. Just a few things. He received his B.A. in 1969 from Yale College. And then his Jewish doctorate in 1972 from Yale Law School. As we've already noted, he was nominated to the seat in September, his judgeship in September of 1980, by Judge Jimmy Carter, uh, President Jimmy Carter. Now I asked, was he retired? And Mrs. Thompson, he quickly told me, oh no. He, 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 you know, right, that, that, that he's not retired. But again, talking about the cases, and, and even we discussed me sitting at the Supreme Court listening to then when Justice Scalia was alive, the redistricting case they had from the state of Alabama. And the reason why that even got an opportunity to go to the Supreme Court is because we had one man that was willing to dissent with all of us to say that there's something wrong with what's happening here. And so again, I, I, as I began, I say that I'm not adequate enough to talk or to introduce this individual, but I am privileged to have the honor to have experienced, to have seen it up close and personal, and to know the heart and the mindset of a man who has impacted this country forever. And that's what true leadership is about. When you can do something that you will reap the benefit from for years to come. And so I'm happy at this time to introduce to you and present to others the Honorable Myron H. Thompson. Turn off my phone, but leave the uh, clock uh, on so that, uh, well, I guess when, some, when you all start walking out, I'll know. <laughs> I've been speaking too long. Uh, President Ross, thank you very much for those very kind words. I was actually looking around to see who you were going to do. Uh, but standing here before you, I 
I'm somewhat humbled by the fact that, uh, uh, you know, when I'm in court, I wear a robe, and uh, which means that uh, I can literally wear anything I want under it, as long as it's tie shows. <laughs> and so uh, I was riding over here today, and my wife was just totally outraged that I'm wearing sleeves that have all these uh, strings coming off. <laughs> and, uh, uh, she, she's, she's even more embarrassed. <laughs> she thinks that she's the one. Some people are going to say that she did it. Uh, uh, but anyway, that's one of the, the perks. You know, there are actually two perks. One of them is you get to wear on the bench this robe that covers your raggedy sleeves. <laughs> the second one is you get to go to the bathroom whenever you want. <laughs> Everybody else has to ask for permission. I say, recess, we'll take a recess. <laughs> and no one knows quite, quite why. Um, actually, I, I, just to go back a little bit, I've uh, uh, gotten a lot of honors lately, but in truth, and if truth be told, I really did not ask for this job. Uh, I don't know if many of you know it, but uh, I turned it down the first time it was offered. And the reason was that I thought I was too young. I was 33 at the time, the youngest judge in the country. And I, I often compared it to going to college without going to high school. I just wanted a few more years of just being able to act silly and not have everyone think that you have to be dignified all the time. Uh, in truth, though, even after I became a judge, I was able to act silly, right, Anne? Uh, but I also felt that uh, the second time people approached me that, that it was an obligation that I had to take. And I sometimes think also that one of the reasons that uh, I, I think I was more daring than other judges uh, at the time and even today is because I was so young I don't think I knew what it was to be afraid. Um, I think my youth gave me a daringness that was needed for the occasion and I think still plays a role even though I obviously am no longer very young. Uh, even plays a role today. Um, recently Getting to the topic here. For one other thing, Dr. E. Uh, D. D. Nixon. Uh, I am so pleased that ASU is honoring him. I. He is a man that for so long was overlooked. Right. Yeah. And uh, I was reading uh, Diane McWhorter's book, Carry Me Home, and how she talks about the critical role that he played in the Montgomery bus boycott and how everyone talked about Dr. King. And unfortunately, no one talked about Nixon, and E.D. Nixon. And it is so wonderful that finally, finally, he's being acknowledged. Because he truly was a giant, and he truly played such an important role in bringing about justice in this community. But about a month or two ago, I was in my driveway, I don't know what I was, either getting in my car or getting out of my car. And I saw three or four ASU students coming up the driveway. Now just to show you what a different time it is, uh, this 40 years ago, those ASU students would not have been in Cloverdale. That's number one. And secondly, though, I saw that they had campaign stickers and buttons. And they were campaigning for a particular candidate. And I saw whose name they were, the person they were campaigning for. And I wasn't particularly sure I wanted to vote for that person. So they started coming towards me, and I was getting ready to explain to them why they probably should be campaigning for someone else. 
And between the time that I saw them and the time I was able to walk down my driveway and meet with them, it was like I had sort of gone through fast forward 70 years, which is how old I am, 71, and realized that my reason for talking to them was wrong. They were the future, and that what I should have done, and what I was, that's what I was saying, what I, in fact what I did, was I got down there, I saw the four or five young men, they were in a group, and I said to them, rather than, I don't particularly support your candidate, I said to them, I am so proud to see your faces in my drive. Mm -hmm. And then I said to them, tell me why I should support your candidate. I started down the driveway to give them a lecture about what I thought democracy meant, and what I thought should happen, rather than walking down the driveway, embracing their activity, and as an older person, listening to what these young people had to say. In other words, I no longer had a closed mind, I had an open mind. And during that transition from the beginning of seeing those young men, those ASU students, and suddenly realizing what my purpose was in greeting them, I realized that you know, I, had, I myself had evolved, and I myself had realized what it means to participate in democracy what it means to cast the ballot. And I thought about, you know, the, the earliest form of, of ballot casting was obviously in Greece. And you know how people cast ballots in Greece? That was the original democracy, with pebbles. And in fact, this is the part of the speech I'm going to call it the pebbles. And what would happen is the citizens would go forward to this community place, and if they supported a, a particular proposal, they would either cast a black or a white pebble. And the pebbles that, uh, uh, you know, if you had more black pebbles or more white pebbles or whatever, the, the thing would either pass or fail. That's the original way people voted. It sounds like a wonderful form of democracy, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> but there's always a backstory. If you were a woman, you couldn't vote. If you were a slave, you couldn't vote. If you didn't own property, you couldn't vote. So, so often sometimes we think that just merely the opportunity to cast a ballot means you have a democracy. Of course, that's not true. And you go back, what, several thousand years in Greece, to talk about those casting of pebbles, which essentially were ballots. And it took that long to get to what I call ground zero of the true meaning of the right to vote. And ground zero is Montgomery, Alabama. It started with, actually in the neighboring uh, city of Vermillion versus Lightfoot, Tuskegee. Mm -hmm. You know, in 70 years I've, I've sort of been able to see all these things that happen, and I've also participated in a lot of things that happen. <coughs> but in Tuskegee, I would have been 8, 9, 10 years old, and I remember so much watching the events in that city. In fact, my uh, earliest memories were that my mom would throw bridge parties. And uh, I guess I must have been about seven or eight years old, and I would crawl among the tables, and the women would always ask me to go get a glass of water if they wanted me to, wanted to say something they didn't want me to hear. <laughs> and I also remember that the women all wore these, you know, these dresses that went out like that, and every last one of them had on high heel shoes, so I was always avoiding being hit with those high heel shoes while I was crawling among the tables on the floor. But they always talked about Dr. Gamillion and just what a giant he was and how important it was 
to participate in democracy. And what the people of Tuskegee came to realize, and I know many of you know about Tuskegee, you know, it had all these doctors, it had all these lawyers, uh, it had all these professors. Wonderful place. But they couldn't vote. The most uneducated black could vote, but a black person in Tuskegee who had 20 PhDs could not vote. And that's what that community taught me about the right to vote, was that you have to take it. And you can have all the education in the world, but unless you're willing to stand up and take it, you won't get it. And of course, Tuskegee eventually filed the Lee versus Lightfoot, which challenged the fact that all the blacks in the city had essentially been put outside the city. They won, they lost the case in the court I sit on. It's one of the few cases Judge Johnson ruled on where he ruled against the plaintiffs. They went up to Supreme Court and it was reversed. And eventually the people of Tuskegee got the right to vote. But still, getting the right to vote doesn't mean that your vote counts. There's a difference between getting the right to vote and having your vote count. And there were cases that came after that. And again, this very community is where it started. The idea of one person, one vote. That came out of Montgomery. This truly is ground zero. And Dr. King, though, knew that an opportunity to vote, to be on the voting rolls, but it didn't mean, still didn't mean that your vote actually counted. And so what he did was, he said, we need a Voting Rights Act. And so what did we have? We had the Selma to Montgomery March. Now, why would you need a march? Well, you can't bring about change if you can't vote. And so Dr. King realized that he had to take to the streets to get that important right. And as a result of that, he got Section 5, he got the Voting Rights Act, including two important provisions, Section 5 and Section 2. When I first went on the bench in the early uh, 1980s, I sat on several what they call three judge courts. I, uh, I guess it was about 34, 35 at the time. Most of my fellow judges, by the way, were in their 50s. But whenever I would sit on a three judge court, because I was the youngest judge in the sense of most recently appointed, not in age, I would always speak first after the hearing was over. The three judges would turn to the other judges and they, they would always defer to the judges the judge with the least seniority. So I was always the one who was called upon to speak first. And I remember another case out of Montgomery that to me taught me about justice and fairness. It was a case in which blacks were just beginning to go to the polls in Montgomery. And Mayor Emery Palmer, do, do many of you remember Mayor Emery Palmer? <laughs> you, know, you, know, you remember Mayor Emery Palmer was once asked what he wanted for his birthday, and you know what he said? Judge Thompson on a rocket to the moon. <laughs> but anyway, uh, he had sent police officers to voting places, black voting places, majority black voting places. And so a lawsuit was filed claiming, why are all these police officers showing up at uh, these polling places for blacks? Obviously the intent was to intimidate the blacks. And when you had the history of, of police officers intimidating blacks and keeping you from voting, you know, you, you thought, oh my goodness, if I go vote, I just may risk getting arrested. Mm -hmm. And that was the intent. <coughs> so the plaintiffs filed a lawsuit. And so we, three judges, heard it. And I had uh, two law clerks at the time. And 
I was trying to do my homework, so I had them do all this research. And I prepared a 30-page memo on why I thought the plaintiffs should win and why these black police officers should be prohibited from going to these voting places and intimidating black voters. And so I'm sitting there with the other two judges after the hearing with my memo, and I start summarizing what's in the memo. And I get to about maybe three or four minutes into it. Uh, it's amazing they stayed awake long enough for me <laughs> to get through it. And Judge Johnson, who was on the panel with me, turns to me and says, Myron, what do you think is the right thing to do? Mm -hmm. And I said, the right thing to do is to get those police officers away. And then he turned to his fellow judge and the other judge, and he says, uh, what do you think is the right thing to do? And the other judge who was Truman Hobbs, senior, not, not the young Truman Hobbs. And he said, I agree. We know why those police officers are there. They haven't been there for 30 years. The only reason they're there is because blacks are starting to vote. And then he turns to me and he says, well, it looks like we all agree with you. The right thing to do is to rule for the plaintiffs. I think you can tear up the rest of that. <laughs> <laughs> and that was my lesson. It was, yeah, theory is important and being prepared is important. And that's what Judge Johnson taught me. <coughs> but doing the right, right thing. Right. Right. That was long before Spike Lee said it. <laughs> <laughs> but th th those were the early lessons in, 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 in the importance of the right to vote. And how it's, you have to be forever vigilant in doing it. And Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act was a very important act because, uh, which, uh, which resulted from the Selma of the Montgomery March, because it provided that before any elected official could change a voting requirement, they had to go to Washington, D.C. to get it uh, approved. Now, why would, you, why, why would you think someone would have to do that? Well, the history was that as soon as a court would rule, that a particular restriction was unconstitutional, the Alabama legislature would pass another one immediately, yeah. and another one immediately, and another one immediately. And it was like, you know, what do you call those things where you're whacking them down? Yeah. Whack them off? It was like that. And so Section 5 prevented that. It said, maintain the status quo. Once I strike down a law, you cannot add a new law unless you go to Washington to get it approved. And it stopped it in its tracks, these efforts to keep people from voting. The second part of the Voting Rights Act that was very important was called Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act. And that essentially was to ensure that minorities had an effective right to vote. And I'm going to talk about that in a minute. Because merely having the right to vote doesn't always mean that it's effective. One of my also early cases was a lawsuit brought challenging the fact that there were no black polling officials at polling places. And the evidence that I heard was that a lot of black people, because they had for so many years been historically prevented not only from both voting, but intimidated to even go to a voting place, you couldn't get them to go to the polls, especially older people. And I said one of the remedies to do that, one of the remedies to that intimidation, it's a very simple remedy, was that if a black person shows up at a polling place, if that black person sees two or more black officials working in that place, mm -hmm. the intimidation goes away. Mm -hmm. In other words, seeing if you are black and historically have always viewed these all white places as intimidating, the remedy was to require that there be black faces at those polling places. Mm -hmm. Someone once told me that that was my greatest decision. 
And I required, this is in the early 80s, that, for, that every polling place in Alabama had to have polling officials who were black, who were the same percentage of black people voting. And that stayed in effect for 20 years. And I think that, you know, it's, 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 it's one thing to say you have the right to vote, but for me, 